And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today on a Thursday and uh, going to be having a great program. You know, defending, explaining the faith often takes us into the realm of explaining history. And uh, that might not be an area that suits everybody. Because, uh, quite frankly, you know, while you're going to school in high school, you're you're probably, unless you're really enamored with history, probably slept through the courses, right? But you know what? It's that's not good because uh, if that's your uh, level of appreciation for history, then you could be susceptible to a lot of distorted history uh, given by anti-Catholics, no popery history, Whig history. Uh, conflict history, all these uh, twistings and turnings of what actually happened in the past. And since uh, the church is a historic entity that has persisted throughout time from the incarnation till today until the second coming, history is important and it's something that we need to know and defend and also be able to explain competently, not only to people that have objections to the Catholic faith, but if you're a parent, especially a homeschool parent, you're going to have to know how to educate your children in Catholic history. And and that's important to have that qualifier, Catholic history. And to help us do that, we're going to have Phil Campbell come on the other side of the break. We're going to talk about his book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. And uh, it's an interesting guide. It, I think it has a lot of application for apologetics because Quite frankly, sometimes you have to lay out an explanation of the historical background to understand and unravel a lot of these uh, anti-Catholic myths. But it's also important to know, like I said, especially for parents, on how to teach history to your kids. Because quite frankly, if we don't teach our kids history as it truly is, which involves the church in a very big way, no one else will. They're not going to learn about Catholicism in public school. And even in some Catholic schools, it seems like even that is not uh, very emphasized. So it's important to be able to give a Catholic uh, educator's uh, perspective on history. So that's coming up on the other side of the break. On this side of the break, we're going to sharpen our critical thinking skills with our Finding the Fallacy segment. Today's Finding the Fallacy is Wishful Thinking Fallacy. Very optimistic kind of fallacy. And also we're going to meet an early church father. Today's early church father isn't an individual per se. It's more of a document. It's known as the Apostolic Constitutions. We talked about the Apostolic Canons in the previous episode. And so now we're going to learn a little bit about the greater work in which the Canons are included. So that's what we got in store for us today. It's going to be a lot of fun. So to kick off the festivities, I want to welcome all of you to the dojo. Welcome aboard, everybody, including our live stream audience and also all of you listening on radio around the country and also tuning in uh, via social media, podcast, and all that other stuff through our multiple distribution centers, our phone app, and, of course, VirginMostPowerfulRadio.org. Welcome all aboard, everybody. Um, great to have you with us. And, by the way, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, that's our website. And you could download this show or any of the other shows that Virgin Most Powerful produces. And you can share with friends. Or you can post on social media. You could do all sorts of stuff with the files. And I really encourage you to do that. That is part of evangelization. It's also a great resource if someone has some questions. Maybe you know a homeschooling parent or maybe just a parent who wants to fortify their children's education in regards to understanding history in a distinctively Catholic way. This is a great program to share with them, and you could do that just by going to virtualmostpowerfulradio.org 
scrolling down to hands-on apologetics and clicking it and you could just uh, share it and uh, uh, share the good information with people so uh, that's what you want to do by the way if you want to send me an email the official dojo mailbox is questions at hands on apologetics.com very easy to remember you know just the, the show name and just put a questions at in front and that comes directly to me the sensei and I do answer your questions and also love hearing from you. Also, uh, I've been really enjoying um, your suggestions for uh, possible future guests. So please keep them coming. If you know somebody who is out there on social media that's doing a bang up job explaining, defending the faith, that you would like to uh, give them an opportunity to get more exposure, please uh, tell me about them. Also, don't forget, please include a, a link or some way in which I could check out their material. Because um, I want to make sure they're dojo quality. And if they are, I definitely will get in contact with them and see if we can arrange uh, a way that they can come on the show and, and more people can access their stuff. So it's a great opportunity for us to help fellow Catholics in the field of apologetics and evangelism. And, uh, yeah, also I should add this. If you have any contact information, that's also important. I've noticed time and time again, especially on YouTube, where there are some really good presentations, great defenses of the faith that I'd love to have as guests, but they don't give any contact information. It drives me nuts. So if you have any personal contact information you could give uh, so that I can uh, respond and things like that, please include that as well. Okay, so let's go to our Finding the Fallacy. Today's Finding the Fallacy, like I said, is wishful thinking fallacy. The description is, uh, when the desire for something to be true is used in place of or as evidence for the truthfulness of the claim. So wishful thinking is more a cognitive bias than a logical fallacy. It can also cause one to evaluate evidence very different, differently based on the desired outcomes. So, yeah, it's more of a bias uh, than an informal fallacy. Um, the desire to uh, want something to be true as proof of the evidence for that particular position. Um I, I'm sure we've met lots of people who have put their whole heart and soul into the truth of a particular proposition. And quite frankly, it's almost like uh, that in and of itself is the only supporting evidence they need to believe it. It's because they want it to be true. And it's a form of self-delusion, quite frankly. Does this appear in apologetics? Yeah, sure it does. You have to be careful. And by the way, that's important for us when we're defending the faith. Make sure that you, you don't commit this fallacy simply because you want it to be true. That doesn't give you right to twist evidence or make things, uh, try to support things that it doesn't. It's also used a lot outside of apologetics, just in social dialogue. Um, man, uh, you know, it's, that's kind of the common currency of conversations today is that people basically back up their assertions only by their convictions, and it's almost like they don't need evidence. They don't need to uh, think critically about the position. What really matters is that they desire it to be so. And uh, if they do that, they are committing today's informal fallacy, today's wishful thinking fallacy. All right. Let's go to meet our early church father, which is the Apostolic Constitutions. Like I said, it's a document. It's not necessarily an individual. The so-called Apostolic Constitutions or the Constitutions of the Holy Apostles by Clement is an interesting work with a curious history, says Jurgen's Faith Early Fathers. In eight books, it is, as one patrol just says, the largest extent collection of legislative and liturgical material of so early a date, which is around 8400. The work pretends to be apostolic in origin, uh, written out and sent around all the bishops and priests by Pope St. Clement of Rome. In that respect, it is a forgery in the grosser and more impious sort. 
Here, uh, the use of Clement's name is not merely a congenial literary device, but it actually is used to deliberately uh, deceive the reader into thinking that it is of apostolic origin. The work may be divided into three parts, embracing books one through six, book seven, and book eight. The first book, a uh, first part, books one through six, is a revision of a work called the Didascalia of the Twelve Apostles, which latter work originated in Syria around AD 200 250. Mostly the Apostolic Constitutions is simple, uh, large part simply brings the Didascalia up to date with more recent legal and liturgical matters. For example, the Didascalia prescribes fasting in Holy Week, whereas the Constitutions extends this to uh, Lent, the full 40 days of Lent. Part 2, the whole of Book 7, can be divided into two sections. Uh, the first one, an enlargement or paraphrase of the Didache, another apostolic father, actually. And the second section is a collection of prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Instructions for teaching catechumens and administration of baptism, catalog of bishops consecrated by the apostles, which list uh, shows a knowledge of the pseudo-Clementine literature, uh, pseudo-St. Clement, and also Eusebius' church history. There is a morning, evening, and meal prayers as well. So interesting collection of writings in that second section, Book 7. And the third and most valuable part of the work, says Jurgens, is the final book, Book 8, and it uh, has the prayers concerning charisms, ordinations, blessings, and, of course, the 85 Apostolic Canons. And that is our early church father for today, the Apostolic Constitution. Coming up next, Bill Campbell is going to talk about teaching history, the Catholic way to stay Hey, Jerry Rodriguez. I'm a monthly donor here in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a retired Phoenix cop, and uh, I've met Jesse before. And um, I just want to tell you, you guys were on fire yesterday. I'm Terry and Jesse, so you guys were on fire. I went to bed thinking, uh, man, what an unwinnable war. But when I got up, I listened to you guys. You know, you guys are doing good work, man, doing God's work, and keep doing it. I know it gets exhausting sometimes, but there's people out here that really need the inspiration and the evangelization that you guys are giving us. So my best to you, and I'm a, uh, Eddie Rodriguez, and I'm a monthly donor and proud of it. Did you know my mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. And as you know, as defenders of the faith, 
history is so important because there's so many distortions and myths out there we deal with. No popery history, Whig history, conflict myth, uh, the, the black legend, all sorts of stuff like that. And so you need to have a good grasp of history and be able to explain it and articulate it to people who perhaps don't understand the historical background. But even more than that, as Catholics, apart from defending the faith, it's important for us to know history because our faith is based in history, of the historic event of the incarnation and church history. If we don't know where we came from, we don't know who we are right now, and we don't know where we're going. So history, history, history is important. And to help us be better Catholic educators in teaching history, we have our good friend, Philip Campbell, with us. Uh, Philip is the author of the story of uh, civilization from Tan Books and many other Catholic uh, curriculum material and subjects on church history and theology. He teaches history for homeschool connections along with myself, and he is the owner of uh, the, okay, let's see if I could get the pronunciation right. Kruakin Hill Good enough. Press. Okay, very Kruakin close. Hill okay. Press. Kroken. Oh, very close. Okay, Kru good. Kru yeah, Kruakin Hill Press. Yep, that's, which is that's independent. That's back to my uh, Scottish roots. <laughs> There you go, uh, which is an independent Catholic publishing house that specializes in works of history and spirituality. And we're talking about the book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. And Philip, welcome back to the show. I'm very glad to be back here again. And that was uh, super interesting, what you were talking about, the apostolic constitutions. I wish I would have logged on a few minutes earlier to hear more of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a weird document, uh, but fascinating, too. Um, uh, just... Uh, uh, the, you know, it's just an accumulation all rolled up into a kind of forgery because <laughs> it yeah. comes to be from Clement when it's not. And uh, but anyway, well, there's, a, there's a lot of that stuff out there. But anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so uh, you're a co-educator with myself at uh, the um, Catholic um, Homeschool Connections and uh, history. I always hear great things, by the way, from my students about your classes. I mean, you are like the rock star on <laughs> online uh, history courses. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad they, they yeah. don't hate it, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's good. I got to raise my bar and, you know, you, you said it. I got I to gotta meet that standard. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, great book. And I think, it, like I said, with apologetics, uh, history is so important because so many objections against Catholicism are history-based. They are. And uh, I, I've always had a special love for this subject because, um, you know, I, I kind of had to rediscover faith as a young man. I was I was baptized Catholic but not raised in the church Um mm -hmm. So, but I had kind of a reversion conversion experience when I was 19, 20 years old. And uh, for a time, I was bouncing around different Christian denominations. You know, I went to the different Protestant churches. Um, I, I tried everything. Uh, I, I even went down to the African American, like full gospel churches in Detroit. <laughs> you know, I was like wow. trying every, every denomination to, to see, w you know, what resonated with me. Um, and you know, what ultimately led me to the Catholic Church or back to the Catholic Church was the study of history and being convinced that that this was the historical church that Jesus Christ had founded. So for me, the historical um, pedigree of Catholicism was tremendously important in, you know, in my own decision to become Catholic. And it's it's always been a center point of my uh, my thinking. So you're right about that. And of course, you, you know, there's the, uh, you know, the famous quote by by John Henry Newman that says to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Like the more you, the more you study Catholic, the history of, of Christendom, the more you see the claims of the Catholic church kind of being vindicated. So I do think it's very central to our identity as Catholics. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, in, in so many different ways, I mean, essentially our sacred text is a sacred history. You know, so even the Bible isn't outside the the purview of history. Yeah, yeah, we have this we have this wonderful phrase, salvation history, right? Which is yeah. the, uh, the the record, the history of God's saving acts in time and space. So yeah, it's a it's a big history story. Our uh, our whole faith, really. So I never asked you this question, but how did you get involved with homeschool connections? <laughs> it was just a series of random. Uh, 
<laughs> I was I was a I was a DRE at a small parish in Ann Arbor, and uh, and Maureen Whitman, who you and I know is the uh, the beloved matriarch of, of Homeschool Connections, she needed her kids to get some sacraments, and she was at a parish that was not very homeschool friendly, you know, and so she was looking around for other parishes that would uh, allow kids to receive sacraments who were homeschooled, you know. And so she came into my office one day and just kind of was like, oh, my, my kids need first communion. Oh, and we were like talking. And then she just was, we were just making small talk. And I told her I had a background in history. And she, she said, oh, my goodness, I'm starting this company called Homeschool Connections. It's going to be online education, you know. And I was like, online education, that's insane. You know, this was like <laughs> 2000, 2008 or something, 2009 maybe. You know, and she's like, yeah, but it's the future. And, you know, I need a history teacher. So she talked me into coming on board, and uh, I've, I've been there ever since. I'm now in my uh, – I can't do math, but I started in 2009, so whatever year that is, 13th, 14th, since then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow, so you were there at the very beginning. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. really. Yeah, I think I was there in, like, year one or something. <laughs> wow. All right. So you should have, like, founder status or something like that. Yeah. I need a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so what's your specialty as far as uh, teaching history in terms of age groups? Is there a particular age that you you like best? Well, I love teaching high school. It's what I've always uh, my, my heart's always been teaching high schoolers. I've uh, I have taught middle school. This year, I taught a couple middle school classes, but probably eighty percent of what I teach is high school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, um, so let's so. I, I suppose the first question would be is really what your first chapter is, is why is history important? We already talked about the apologetics angle, uh, but, uh, you know, explaining to Catholic parents why they need to, maybe they need to supplement the history that they're already receiving. Why is history important for Catholics? Yeah. So the first chapter in the book, the uh, the Catholic Educator's Guide to, to Teaching History right here. Okay. Um, so. Um, the first chapter I dedicated to just why should we teach history? And I think there's not a lot of understanding on this. Like a lot of Catholic parents, I think they just have a sense that, well, we just need to teach history because it's one of the courses. It's just, it's math, it's science, it's history. We just need to teach it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just, just because, um, or kind of this vague sense of like, well, you know, we need to so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of understanding of the, the positive values of learning history. Like if your child were to say to you, Mom, why do I have to know? Uh, why do I have to know this particular historical content? Um, you know, what would you say? It, you know, if you're if you're if you're going through the history of the Roman Empire, you know, and your mom and your kid says, why do I need to know this? You know, what value will this add to my life? Where in my professional life will somebody ever say like, hey, who was the third emperor of the Roman Empire? And you need to get it right, you know. So uh, I, I think a lot of people don't know the positive value of knowing history. And I, I really went, speaking of Romans, I went back to Cicero in, in the first huh. chapter. And, uh, and um, you know, Cicero has this excellent uh, discussion where he says, if you don't know history, you remain perpetually a child. You know, you think about a child only tends to know what's going on in your uh, in their, you know, think about a little kid like they only know what they're doing that day. They only know what's going on in their own house and their own immediate vicinity. They're very focused on right now and, and what's going on. Uh, they don't really have a sense of like the past, the future, whatever. Um, and Cicero kind of extrapolates that to society and says, if we as, as, as citizens don't know history. It's like we are children. We don't have a concept of what's going on in other lands, what's going on before we were born, how we got where we are, be able to see where we're going. Um, history is really bound up with identity. You know, you think about in a movie, you watch these movies where somebody loses their memory, you know, something like the Bourne movies or anything where there's amnesia, you know, where somebody wakes up and they're like, now, if that person can't remember their history, their identity is gone, right? Mm -hmm. they, they don't know what they are or who they are, you know. So history mm -hmm. is identity. Um, it's a part of reflecting on who we are as people and understanding uh, where we've come from and what it means to be human. That's why it's classed with the liberal arts. And traditionally, the Greeks, this was one of the this was one of the seven muses or is there nine muses, seven, nine? It, well, one of the muses um, <laughs> was, was history, you know, along with poetry and art and things like that. 
um, these disciplines that helped us to cultivate our humanity, right? Um, history is the study of human nature. And uh, Gary, you probably know if you, I, sorry, I keep, I keep making cinematic references, but if you ever seen a movie where there's a, there's an alien that comes to earth, you know, or a robot, you know, and it wants mm -hmm. to learn everything about human nature, they always have this scene where the robot like goes, picks up like a history book or scrolls through like human history. Uh, you ever seen, you ever seen this? Oh, yeah, uh, the, the, the robot will be the, the alien wants to learn what humans are about. So it goes onto the computer and it's like it'll show a scene with all the history scrolling by, you know, or uh, or reading a book or something. So it's mm -hmm. the sense that like to understand humanity is to understand our history. So um, it's really the same arguments as to why literature is important. There's a lot of carryover between literature and history. It's to help form our mind. It's to help put us in touch with our humanity. It's a sense to. Uh, it, it helps to get a sense of the big issues of what being a, a human is all about, you know, and that's just the big picture. Then you can zoom into like, well, you know, uh, American history or Catholic history, which kind of has the same rationale, but for our specific subgroups of being Americans or being Catholics or, or what have you. So I think it's very much about deepening our identity and, and just building up our uh, building up our personhood, you know, similar to the other liberal arts. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so important, especially for Catholics, because in many ways, I think our Catholic identity has eroded and uh, we just feel like we're just a wash in the world not, without any distinction, you know, with us. And I think large part that's because we've forgotten our own history. Yeah. Yeah. We've forgotten it. We don't have any connection with it. I mean, you think about your historical identity as a Catholic, it's it's supposed to be like home, you know, like the world changes, but like our identity as Catholics, that's something that's abiding, you know. But think of how you would feel, Gary, if you came back to your house and all your furniture and everything was just gone and it, there was just a bunch of new stuff in there. It was all put in different positions. You know, you would just kind of feel like this isn't home. Like, I know I'm physically in the same house, but that sense of hominess, you know, when you come back from a trip and you're like, ah, I'm home, you know, that would be yeah. totally disrupted if we got rid of everything in your house and rearranged it. And I think that's the sort of problem a lot of Catholics have today. We've been disconnected from our history. So we go into our churches, you know, we go to mass, we, do, we, we go through the routine. But to the degree that we've been cut off from that, uh, that history, it's kind of that same experience coming into your physical house, but everything's been rearranged and something, you know, something feels a little off. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely uh, feel alien in a sense, you know, like a stranger in, in a far off country. And yeah, I hear I hear the music coming up. This would be a good place to pause. <laughs> we are chatting with Philip Campbell, author of the book "The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History." More to come right after this. Sirach 1124 says, Do not say I am self-sufficient. What harm can come to me now? According to St. Catherine of Siena, presumption is like vermin burrowing at the root of the tree of our soul. If we do not uproot it with great care and humility, it will eventually destroy the soul. May God keep us from all presumption of mind and heart and realize that we depend on him for everything. This is a catechetical minute from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Jesus does not reveal the Holy Spirit fully until he himself has been glorified through his death and resurrection. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 728. God has put humanity on a need-to-know basis. Although God is eternally triune, he waited until the fullness of time to reveal his Son, and only in these last days, revealed and sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. Holy Spirit, fill us with the love of God, and make us worthy servants of his Son, Jesus. This has been a Catechetical Minute, from Virgin Most Powerful Radio.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Catholic educator Philip Campbell about his book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. You can get it at crockandhill.com. And uh, we're going through, uh, it's a great book. I, I love it. It's very practical. Chapter three, I think, is really fitting for uh, Catholic apologists because sometimes we're called upon to, you know, give a short, I guess you could say lecture, you know, laying out the history of a particular event or series of events. And that might be in person, face to face. It might be in front of an audience if you're doing uh, public apologetics or online. And what I love about your chapter there is you give some really good practical tips that I think a lot of people would miss. I mean, it's posture and correct breathing and things like that. Yeah, and it really makes uh, it really makes a difference too whether you're online or in real life. And uh, I've seen in my years as an online educator that there's a lot of real dynamic uh, teachers who can teach well in real life, but then they transition to an online platform, and it just falls flat because they don't know how to um, to present online. Um, or, or people who don't know how, uh, how many of us out there have sat through a bad PowerPoint presentation where you're like, okay, you're just reading off the slides. Like why is this even yeah. a thing, you know? So, um, you know, the, the, there's, yeah, there's lots of practical tips on delivering a history lecture, which I guess could apply to anything like you said, but for history, what I always tell, tell people though, is, uh, I think especially at the younger ages, you need to be attentive to the narrative structure of, uh, of history which means if you're talking to a younger child, let's say like, you know, uh, like sixth grade on down, you really want to be attentive to the the story aspect of, of history. You want to deliver history lectures that that uh, that I think really have a have a story structure. Like there's a there's a character, the character's doing something. You know, this is the things they overcame. These this is the results of the character's actions. Because obviously history is just the you know the uh, the sum collections of a bunch of individual actions of, of people, right? So it's really great when you're going back through history and you can you can say, okay, we're going to learn about George Washington. You know, here's who he was. Here's uh, here's what he did. Here's some things that happened. And you're kind of telling the story of George Washington, but by telling that story, you're introducing him to this whole world that George Washington lived in, the Revolutionary War era how his actions made an impact, you know, but you're keeping it like very character centric, you know, very, and that, that's what, that's what young children respond to best, I think, because you think of like a very elementary age student. I mean, the most important factors in their life are always going to be people, you know, their parents, their siblings, their teacher, people that they see on a day in day out basis. So um, I think that's, they respond best to. So that's one of my big pieces of advice especially if you're talking to younger kids, is don't try to focus on abstractions and things that would be more appropriate for older ages. You know, just keep it very character focused. Like you're telling a lot of stories about interesting men and women from history, you know, and that's that's really a, a good way to build, you know, help help the child put themselves in that period. And then when they get older, you can start introducing the abstract stuff and talk about ideas and isms and, and things like that, that, you know, you want to get into in high school. So I, I think that's a great piece of advice um for for people working with younger kids especially yeah yeah and uh even for older kids um you could always still maintain that that character as a, a core but just flesh out some of the isms and the other more abstract things like chronological order things like that yeah yeah and i remember um i remember when i was a young man i was a, there was yeah e even in college there was a book called uh I think it was called 1066 and all. No, no. What was it called? It was called yeah, uh, 1066, 1066 and all that. And all that. Um, or maybe so. maybe I'm confusing it with everything you want to know about history, but we're too afraid to ask. I don't know. But there was a okay. there was a history text I read, 
and the, the author had all these chapters on various parts of history, and he wrote a chapter on the Punic Wars. And instead of saying, like, here's the history of the Punic Wars, he just said, like, uh, we're going to talk about the story of Hannibal, you know. And the, the chapter was basically a biography of Hannibal, but through Hannibal, you experience the whole Second Punic War. And I remember how engaging it, like I, I'm still talking, it was 2002, I read it, you know, so it mm -hmm. stuck with me, you know, so yeah, even as a college student, I was like, dang, this, uh, this narrative approach is, is fun, you know, it helps you pull all these pieces together sometimes. Yeah, yeah, very good. So yeah, so you have to uh, gear your uh, lecture to your audience. So if you're yeah. uh, presenting for your own homeschool kids, uh, you definitely want to keep that in mind uh, as opposed to older groups. What's the main difference between online lecturing and in-person lecturing? Yeah, well, um, in person, you have a lot more control over your physical presence, right? You think about if you see a dynamic speaker in real life, that speaker has many ways of engaging you, not just with what he or she is saying, but with the way they move about the room, the way they they they, they walk, move their body, the projection, there's all these ways that the physical speaker can engage you. When you go to an online platform, you're deprived of 90% of that. You know, all you have is your your face. <laughs> and, yeah. and then whatever visual aid you're putting up, if you have a PowerPoint or something. So um, if, you're, if, you're, if your face and your projection aren't aren't good and if your powerpoint is is bad <laughs> then you immediately just lose a hundred percent of your charisma you know when you go online so the biggest thing about teaching online is you have to be able to compensate for what you lack by by going on the online medium you're not able you, you know like when i teach in real life i'm very active like i'm i'm moving around the room i'm interacting with the podium i'm turning around and writing on the whiteboard you know i'm doing all sorts of stuff that i can't do so i rely much more heavily um in an online platform on uh, on my facial expressions, on my PowerPoints, which I work very hard to make really colorful. Um, if you if you are doing online presentations, you know we don't need a, we don't need a white screen with bullet points. You know um, we need something colorful with pictures. You know, like if I'm talking about if I'm saying like I'm going to tell you five things about ancient Rome, I don't have a white power. A, a beautiful, colorful picture of the Roman Forum, you know, uh, something that engages your eyes and is pleasant to look at that draws you in or some piece of Roman art, some statue. And then I can talk and, and the student can listen and take in what I'm saying while their eyes kind of focus upon the, the beauty of whatever illustration that uh, that I'm displaying. So, yeah, if you're doing online education, uh, you got to be using pictures and colorful stuff and knock off with the putting long lists of text on a white screen uh that's just that's just uh i mean that's like torture yeah yeah and <laughs> yeah and one thing i i almost always do is i put too much on the screen at once and it's just over information overload and uh yeah well yeah. i think i think uh, what, a, what a lot of teachers do is they put the information on the screen for them and not the students like they think I need to remember what I'm lecturing about, so I'm going to put this information so I can read it when I get to it, you know, rather than just kind of remembering the presentation is for the student, not for you, you know. So yeah. keep your notes somewhere else, you know, don't put them on the PowerPoint. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, and I, I know uh, you experienced this as well. When you're lecturing live in front of somebody, um, you get immediate feedback whether they understand what you're saying, whether they don't, whether they like it, whether they're put off. Online, you really don't get that int intimate feedback from the audience. No, I guess you don't, unless the chat is on and they're giving you emojis or something, you know. But Yeah, right. But there's been, you know how that is, but there's been times where I've been lecturing online and you just get a quiet class, you know, and I'll be lecturing and there's just no response. And I'm you start to think like, is my internet connection off? Like, am I right. talking to nothing? Like, and so I'll just stop and say, you guys with me? And then they'll be like, thumbs up, you know? But uh, yeah, it's different not having that immediate feedback. You have to really have a lot more, be able to draw from your own wellspring, you know, as a presenter and not kind of like depend on the energy of the crowd. So that's a challenge too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, in some ways, I think that was the hardest thing for me to get used to was... Uh... You know, having uh, uh, mediated feedback, you don't really get, you can't read faces, you don't 
kind of hear mumbling or things like that. It's all cut off. And uh, it's uh, so you kind of have to kind of entertain yourself, you know, and hopefully you can yes. pick up clues in the chat room or something, whether people are with you or not. Yeah, you just have to be engaging. You, you just have to have a, a soliloquy with yourself and, and hope that they find it amusing or entertaining. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And then now I'm doing radio where I, the only feedback I get is my wall. So it's, it's even more <laughs> or more or I should say even less uh, feedback. Uh, well, once so, uh, what, what, in the future, we'll upgrade you to being on a desert island, throwing out notes in a bottle, you know. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it could be the you know, Internet goes down. No one hears a word, but I'm having a great conversation with myself in this room. Um, yeah. yeah, so you also mentioned, I don't know if it was this chapter or <clears throat> uh, associate chapter, but the importance of clarity to be very specific about the topic you go and lecture on. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially when you're doing, um, I, I think the context of what you're referring to is especially when you're doing assessments, like if you're trying to find out what your kid has learned or um, giving them a test or something like that. You have to be very, very specific on what you're asking, uh, especially for like middle age kids, or middle school age kids, if they haven't um, gotten into abstract levels of thinking yet. Um, so, you know, you can't you can't give kids a question like uh, tell me about the Civil War or something like that. You know, it's what ha their mind just goes, you know, they have a <laughs> they just have a breakdown. It's it's too vague. It's too big. They don't know what you're asking. Um Sometimes even you think the question is clear, but the, the kid doesn't think it's clear. You know, um, you can you can ask a question like, uh, you know, which medieval king did this or that, you know, and you think it's clear. But the kid is thinking like, well, but there was three different kings that did these different things. And which one is he asking about? Is this a trick question? Uh, you know, so um, you got to make sure that whatever you're doing, that there's only one right answer. I'm talking mainly for lower grades. When you get older, you can start with essays and analytical thinking and stuff like that. But as long as you're still with younger grades, you know, you want to keep stuff very much on the level of clarity so that there's only one possible right answer, not a mul not a whole bunch of like, well, maybe if you consider it this way, maybe he means it like this, you know. Um, a lot of people, I think kids naturally love any subject as long as they can grasp what it is. It's when the math gets confusing it's when the history gets confusing, when they're like, I don't know what I'm expected to learn. Then they start to dislike it. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. We're chatting with Phil Campbell, talking about his book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. More to come right after this. Here's a great way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Do you have an old car you want to get rid of, motorcycle, RV, or boat? Simply call 855-500-7433, and when they sell that vehicle, a portion of that money comes right back to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. It's an easy way to do it. I want to thank you for it. Call 855-500-7433. God love you and your family. We got Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know? You That's know, right. If God gave us a lot, and I have the blessing of listening to all this, and I just want to call all the people, you know, I got five kids. I don't make a lot of money, and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the Divine Mercy Chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys. But everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I no love it. out there.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We're chatting with Phil Campbell about his book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History, which is really important for us Catholics to uh, be able to hand on the faith and hand on history especially to our kids and of course in apologetics we deal a lot with history and that's a, there's a lot of carryover in this book uh, so it, maybe you're a homeschooling parent who struggles with teaching history this book is perfect for you if you're an apologist and you want to get better at understanding and explaining church history i think there's a lot of great tips in this book that's also uh, applicable to you as well uh, for example uh you have a chapter on note taking which I thought was really cool because thinking back in my own personal history, I don't think ever anybody had taught me how to take notes. They just say, remember, take notes during class. But how do you take notes? Uh, and, you know, and often what happens is I'm busy writing down something, and then there's all these other important points that are being made. By the time I'm done with my note, I've missed half the class. Yeah, you know, that was a problem I had to uh, where, well, I should say, I, I, note taking always came intuitively to me. I never had a problem with it. So I didn't really think that other people don't know how to take notes. You know, some people just get it. Some people don't. You tell them to take notes and they're just like, ah, they write. They, so I would get questions from students saying, like, I love your class, but there's so much information and I can't take the notes. My hand has fallen off. Like, uh, I don't understand what I'm supposed to be writing down. And so... I put that chapter together for students, especially who don't, you know, have never been told how to take notes. And really what happens generally is a student who doesn't know how to take notes, they think they're just supposed to try to write everything. And so, you know, I'm sitting here like talking a million miles a minute and they're like writing everything down, you know, and obviously you can't keep up like that. So, you know, what a student has to do is learn how to, when you're listening to somebody say something, uh, almost like when you read a paragraph, you understand like, OK, there's a thesis sentence of a paragraph. That's what this paragraph is about. And everything else is just establishing it or, you know, are, you know, examples of it. So you kind of have to teach them to do that audit, you know, w with their uh, auditory skills. Like when I when I launch off onto a point, p presuming your teacher is a good teacher and doesn't just ramble, you know, uh, mm -hmm. when when the teacher launches off on a point, you got to think like, what is the main point that that they are communicating and that's what you write down the main point. I mean, most teachers, they're not going to quiz you on the minutia. You know, if, if, if I say in the year 378, the, the Roman Empire had a crushing defeat at the Battle of Adrianople uh, against the Goths and the Emperor Valens was killed and 27,000 men died. You know, in my notes, I'm just going to write Battle of Adrianople, Romans lose. You know, that's what I'm going to write because I know that teacher isn't going to be like, how many Goths died in that battle? You know, um, you, you know the teachers are looking for the main points by and large to make sure you get the concepts. They're not trying to play gotcha with the minutia. So I try to teach students to hear hear a historical fact or you know an apologetical fact or whatever, and just mm -hmm. kind of mentally extrapolate what's the point, what is the main point of this, you know, and that itself takes some practice, you know. So sometimes I'll do private tutoring with students where we'll get on a Zoom call and I'll put a paragraph up on the board on the on the Zoom and I'll just say, what is this paragraph about? You know, and then uh, kind of see what they say. And if they can't figure it out, I help them to, to figure out, you know, to look, OK, here's how you tell what the main point is, you know, and that's really the key. You know, if you're a good note taker, somebody can be ranting and you just know you're writing down the main points. And then if you find those extra details interesting, if you want to know that there was 27,000 Goths dead or whatever, then you have the time to write it down because you've already gotten the main points. So yeah, that's, uh, that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And I think probably today more than when you or I were kids because so many more people today are, are taking notes digitally or they didn't have to grow up in an environment with like a pen and pencil. Um, 
uh, you know, like we did. So I think it's more of a problem these days, which is why I put a whole chapter on it. Yeah. 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 Especially, I mean, I know with myself, when I'm in a debate, note taking is important because the person's making their opening statement could have 50 different points to it. And I got to really discern what I need to remember with my rebuttal. So yeah. uh, it's really important to use that uh, discernment process while recording it. Otherwise, you know, I'll have a bunch of useless information in my notes. Exactly. And then yeah. when it, especially if you're getting quizzed on it, you know, they, they wrote down all this useless information and then you're like, okay, study for the test. And their notes are just like a muddle. Then, you know, then, then it creates this cycle where they get to, depressed about it they do bad then they start to think i stink at history i don't like history you know it just goes dark you know yeah yeah absolutely and also i i you have a really good point about incorporating primary source material in your uh education and i think that in itself is really important um maybe you could expound a little bit on why it's important well, yeah, I mean, you probably run to this as an apologist, like what you do is study primary source material, you know, uh, there's there's so much of it. But I think it's important to, uh, you know, until modern times, that's what history was, was reading historical texts. You'd go back and you'd read Herodotus or, you know, Thucydides, and you'd just read the actual historical writings. Um, I think it's important for students to do this, A, just to be exposed to what his historical writing is actually like to understand that there's different points of view. Uh, it challenges them from a literary perspective because historical writing isn't always the easiest, <laughs> you know? So it always challenges them. Um, I, I just think it's a good a good practice overall to expose them to that as a, as a literary practice, as a historical practice. And it helps, it, you know, people often ask me, what about historical bias? Like, how do I inoculate my kids against that, you know? I mean, the best way to do that is to have them read lots of history. You know, it's kind of like if somebody asked me, like, how do I make sure my kids don't read bad literature? The best answer is to expose them to lots of literature so that they are able to recognize what is bad literature in contrast to good literature. You know, mm -hmm. if your kid, if, if somebody never picks up a book unless it's, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey or something, then they don't have a barometer for what constitutes and the same thing with history. I like to have them read a whole lot of different stuff uh, from a whole lot of viewpoints, you know. And sometimes I'll tell them, what you're about to read is heavily biased and see if you can tell why. <laughs> and then they'll read it and they'll be like, oh, yeah, this, this is clearly, you know. So if, if you want kids to grow up to be adults that can recognize bias and historical sources, the best thing to do is let them read lots of history and expose them to all sorts of writers. Obviously, in a controlled environment, you know, you don't want to just send them out and be like, go on the Internet and read whatever you want, you know. <laughs> right. But uh, you want to just give them sources and, and you know, and we study it. We'll, we'll read through and we'll say, like, uh, what point of view do you think the author supports here? Why do you think that? You know, what sort of keys are there in the text that tell you that the author is pushing this particular, uh, you know, whatever. When you, mm -hmm. What I say in the book, when you see that ancient Egyptian picture of Ramesses the second fighting the Hittites and Ramesses in the engraving is this big and the Hittites are this big. Like, what do you think Ramesses thinks of himself? You know, <laughs> like yeah, right. um, when his enemies don't even come up to his shins, you know, um, what is its value as propaganda? So these are all important things, you know, to understand, but that's where primary sources come in and, and also just gets you in, immersed in the nuts and bolts of history. It's kind of like you can't really do math without wading into the nuts and bolts of the equations you can't do literature without sitting down and reading Shakespeare, and you can't do history, you know, without actually reading some historical documents, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought uh, you were going to say, you know, just give them the classics, you know, the best, and then they could yeah, you know, what's less. But I like your approach better, because uh, then you can <laughs> see that, you know, history can be a tool for people to, you know, promote their agendas. Um, I guess the the next logical question would be, well, obviously, I, I wouldn't give my, my son, you know, Herodotus and, and say, you know, read this or, or Pliny or something. Uh, it would just be too much and too overwhelming, you know, to go yeah. through the entire works. So is there, um, are there helpful resources that perhaps could break down, you know? Uh, yeah, well, uh, really, for for younger kids, they're just not going to read primary sources. They're just too right. much. Um, for younger kids, it's good. If you want to look at primary stuff, show them art, show them paintings, show them architecture, 
show them the pyramids, you know, that's good stuff. That's primary sources in a certain way, you know. Mm -hmm. When you get older, then you can read primary sources. Um, I personally have published three source books. Um, they're available through Kruikin Hill Press. I have one on the Reformation, one on the Middle Ages, and one on the Church Fathers. And so I, I take these readings and I present little excerpts. I give a little explanation of like, here's what you're about to read. I have like the pertinent text, and then I have some study questions for the, you know, the, the child to think through. Those are perfectly appropriate for uh, for high school, you know. So you definitely want to get like a source book or something that has, you know, ha has like a collection of the texts um, that can be arranged for like a pedagogical purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So hey, you you led me into the last section I want to talk about before our time is up. It's yeah. about all this stuff that you have, all the resources. So there, there's three. Uh, uh, books that you have that are collections of, of uh, historical essays, uh, early church fathers, and uh, other things. Um, what are those titles? Yeah, so one is called The Rending of Christendom on the Reformation. The other is The Catholic Middle Ages, and then The Antonicene Fathers, and they're all Catholic source books. So if you go to uh, com, which is C-R-U-A-C-H-A-N, hill.com, uh, they're, they're all on there. You can get the source books and the answer keys. And they have, each book has like, I think at least 35 primary sources with study questions. Um, so yeah, you can start from the church fathers, go all the way through the reformation. I'm still working on, on other ones, but, um, those are great resources. I've got, uh, you know, of course the story of civilization books from Tan are excellent resources as well. And I've got some other stuff. Uh, I've got a great book on the dark ages, the so-called Dark Ages oh, through yeah. Ave, Ave Maria Press that just came out. I think did we do a we did an episode yeah, we did on a, that, didn't we? We did a program on it. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, dark yeah, at all. <laughs> yeah, we did, and I'm really uh, I've got a uh, I've got a couple of things coming out soon. I've got a book on the the history of the Philippines for middle schoolers coming out from uh, Arcs Publishing. Interesting. Um, so, and then I've got two historical fiction novels on Padre Pio and Saint Genevieve coming out from Tan. Uh, this fall. So there's a lot of stuff. If you want to keep up with what I'm publishing, the easiest way is to just follow me on Facebook. If you're on Facebook under uh, Philip Campbell, author, teacher, I'm constantly plugging my uh, plugging my goods on there, hawking my wares in the marketplace, as it were. <laughs> and and this book, the uh, the Catholic Educator's Guide Teaching History, you guys will love it. It's very it, it's short, but it's packed with information. It's just over 100 pages. Um, you can get it at cruikenhill.com. And I think we're going to put the link below this uh, this video when this goes online. Uh, but also you can find it on Amazon. Just look up Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History by Philip Campbell. And uh, you can find it there as well. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, Philip, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. All right. Peace out, Gary. All right. Take care. See That's yep. Phil Campbell. Uh, yeah, check out his stuff at crookenhill.com, or you could go on Amazon.com. Uh, the name of the book is The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. Wow, the hour's flowing. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you with the Terry and Jesse Show. Thank you so much for listening, and God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow. Do this thing we call hands-on apologetics. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.